Welcome everybody to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission uh, meeting for DeKalb, Illinois, this Monday, April 4th. Uh, I'll ask to start with a roll call. Becker? O'Flaherty? Here. Pena Graham? Here. Stoker? Wright? McMahon? Here. Chair Maxwell? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. I will ask for an approval of the agenda, if anyone would like to motion that. I move that we approve the agenda as presented. Moved by McMahon. I'll second. Seconded by O'Flaherty. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. <coughs> we'll look to the minutes of the March 7th meeting. Um, if there are any additions or deletions, if not, I'll ask for a motion to approve. I move to approve as submitted. Moved by O'Flaherty. Second. Seconded by Pena Graham. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. This is the public participation of the meeting. Uh, if anyone would like to say something or speak to something that is not on the current agenda, um, you can come forward now and um, please state your name and your address. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I, you, please, yes. Please note for the record real quickly that um, Stoker has arrived, so we have five. <coughs> Hello, my name is Cliff Cleland. Uh, I've been in this town since 1962 when I came here to go to school, the university, and I'm still here, raised a family here. And I've seen a lot of changes in, in the town. And uh, uh, I really love the place. I love the downtown. I want it to be thriving and everything. And my concern is that uh, things will not go in the way I want, want them to go. I want them to be better, whatever that is. I had some questions <clears throat> based on the <clears throat> story that appeared in the Chronicle uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, Mr. Cleland, uh, if, if this pertains to the project that's on the agenda, um, th there will be a portion um, later when we can speak to that, but this, is only for, this, this segment is only for things that are not on the agenda. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you'll have an opportunity. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. I have to remember them myself. Um, we'll move on to, oh. No. Yeah. Um, I, just items. We'll have the applicant get up and present, then we can have the yeah. public speak after the mm -hmm. applicant and staff. Yeah, um, we have one item of new business, a sketch plan, concept plan, a request by John Souser for review of a sketch plan, concept plan, uh, for construction of approximately 32 apartment units in the existing building at 145 Fisk Avenue. And I understand Mr. Souser has a presentation. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, I know uh, staff has kind of some uh, photos and renderings that uh, are going to kind of be flipping through um, but uh, while, I, while I speak. So uh, for those of, that, of you that I haven't met, my name is John Saucer. Uh, grew up in DeKalb, uh, went to school all the way through here and had my business uh, here uh, my whole life. So I've been a DeKalb resident and a vested member of the community for many, many years. Um, so. I've known of this building uh, way back when I was in high school. I actually uh, met uh, Joe Lacasio when he was uh, part of the school board or uh, at administration when this was the administration building. Um, and sadly, this building has been vacant for some 25 years. And for those that you hear tonight are probably very familiar because you have uh, comments or thoughts one way or the other um, and probably want, like myself, want to see uh, something good happened with the property. Probably we all feel that it's a shame that it's sat vacant for as many years as it has had, or that it has. And um, the the current ownership, I know this has kind of gone through some different ideas and planning over the years, but the, you know, the current owner, um, while hasn't developed it as long as he's owned it, I think has made good strides with the building. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, you know, maybe a dozen years ago, it did at least have a new roof put on it, and it had um, asbestos remediated out of it. Um, and you know, and 
mitigated some of the dangers of a vacant building sitting there. They've you know boarded up the windows and tried to make it somewhat presentable for the amount of years. Now, I think we all agree it could probably have looked a little bit better, or certainly can look better. Um, but you know, the goal of obviously when you have a building sitting vacant like this for so many years, you know, what do we do with it? I guess we either redevelop it and save what we can, or we tear it down. I would venture to guess that everyone looking at this building can see that it has really good bones and it's a pretty building and it's history. So tearing it down probably isn't the best option. Hopefully you agree with me that um, due to its history and the structure that uh, we can bring it back to life and make, some, make something that looks nice and also can fit in with the existing community uh, that is there now. Um, so obviously different ideas have been floated um, and so there's only so many certain things that you know a building like that can lend itself to and what it's um, set up for. Um, the way I interpreted it, it seemed uh, best suited within the local community to be apartments. Um, certainly uh, there are between one and four bedroom apartments um, throughout the city, uh, but I would say, venture to say that throughout this part of the community there's more one and two bedroom apartments, um, probably a little more quieter um, residential area than other multifamily projects. So uh, what we're looking to do is do mostly one and two bedrooms, so it'll be um, a lower density of you know per person versus if you had four bedroom apartments there and, and a high density of people per unit. Um, so as far as parking, there's already an existing you know parking lot there. Um, it does have um, egress, a curb cut on Fisk. It's not really being used right now, but there's a curb cut there. And then um, it has egress. Uh, ingress and egress on Sycamore Road. Um, I, my goal was to use the existing entrance, but staff and the engineers have determined that it really is too close to the intersection, so they're suggesting moving it to the north, northeast on Sycamore Road to better accommodate uh, traffic flow away from the stoplight. Uh, but there, if you look at the site plan, there's plenty, uh, actually more than were required of uh, a parking existing already uh, or that uh, will fit on the site there that's basically already the paved area that is there. You might not realize it because there's you know some growth that, that has happened on the existing parking lot, but really all that open area that's there now is an, an existing parking lot. Um, so uh, trying to revive it and bring it back to life, um, it does have really great bones. Um, I think it, looking at, and you know, certainly growing up here, knowing um, that local community within DeKalb of what's there, um, you know, obviously it's kind of in the buffer zone between a lot of multifamily and then the start of some single family. But certainly the way the building has been, it's been there long before a lot of those single family homes have been built. Um, so it's kind of one of those coming to the nuisance types of things. I know it's probably been sleepy and quiet because nothing's been going on there for 25 years, but our goal is to keep it quiet and in line with the neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, residential, you know, one and two bedrooms are about the quietest type of living I think that you can get uh, that would very well suit this particular building. Um, the existing landscaping, obviously there's a lot of mature trees around there um, on the front as well as abutting the neighbors. Uh, the goal is to certainly uh, keep as many of those mature trees as possible in landscaping and any um, trees or uh, bushes that do need to, that might be in the way. I don't really think there's any large ones that are in the way, which is good. Um, but anything that needs to be cut down, obviously we will you know, replace and uh, add more and try and make it look beautiful and so it does it won't look like a brand new building with you know 16 inch shrubs all surrounded by mature landscaping in the neighborhood so well the vast majority of the mature trees are going to stay so that's that's our goal is to make it look as nice and, and still blend in with the uh, existing neighborhood certainly being fisk is a quiet street that i think probably <coughs> half the town probably drives by first street and doesn't even know about especially being a one-way uh, but Sycamore Road obviously is a start there, and so um, you know that's one of our major arteries. So, being multifamily, I think it fits in that it's certainly it's walking distance to our 
downtown to the university. It's right on you know uh, bus routes uh, as well as you know major arteries that you know I don't think traffic flow is going to be a problem um, going in and out of Sycamore Road. That you're not going to have a huge influx of traffic going down Fisk or you're bothering some of the other small side streets um, like to Kelb Avenue or Second or whatnot that um, would be close to there. So that is the general concept. Um, you know, we're, the way the floor plan looks out, we're trying to keep it with exactly within the existing footprint of the building. So you already have a kind of a predefined space to work with, and then you start laying out your floor plans with, you know, according to your code and what you can fit. So if some, anyone thinks 32 units sounds like a lot, um, we could do half that many and make them four bedrooms and have four unrelated people living there, but I don't think that's really the better option to go. I think smaller, quieter units, um, you know, one and two bedroom units tend to have longer residency, so you're going to have uh, a multi-year tenants versus all the units turning over every single year, which again um, kind of creates to more a stable neighborhood and less interruption with your, your local neighbors. Uh, so that's kind of uh, everything I've prepared, but I'm certainly, I can sit down or I can take questions, whatever you would like. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Um, does the staff have a report? Yeah, I did a brief uh, memo in your packets. Uh, um, John went through uh, quite a bit uh, explaining the project. Uh, but the site is um, currently zoned neighborhood commercial. Uh, of course, a building on there, four stories, 24,000 square feet, uh, proposing 32 apartment units, uh, nine two-bedroom, and 23 one-bedroom. Um, square footage, the applicant indicates about 650 square feet for the two-bedroom, or one-bedroom and uh, two-bedroom, about 900 square feet. Leases will be at market rate. Uh, and there's a summary in your background. Uh, history, John, you kind of alluded to a little bit of the history on the site. Um, of course, uh, St. Mary's Hospital closed in 65, then it was a dormitory for a short time, then the uh, Calb School District Administration building for 20 plus years. And then uh, more recently in 2006, property was sold to the current owner. Uh, the intent, I think, was rezoned at that time to do luxury lofts, that obviously didn't materialize. And then in 2019, there was a 40-room boutique hotel proposed. That project did not go forward. And they did a concept plan that was in front of the commission. So a concept plan or sketch plan, as the UDO refers to, is um, a chance for the applicant to get feedback uh, from the uh, commission, the staff, uh, residents. Uh, there's no motion required. It's not a, a yes or no approval. Um, just some feedback so they can proceed to the next step, which would be a rezoning application and the preliminary engineering plans and a public hearing, which would entice, again, notification to owners within 250 feet uh, to appear at a hearing if they wish to comment. Um, so it's not a hearing, but we're going to have public comment. We've sent letters out uh, to the surrounding owners within 250 feet, enticing their uh, feedback, and we did get a few, which I'll go over in a little bit. Um, as noted, the uh, little bit on the site plan, uh, obviously using a lot to the current building and the, uh, John mentioned the access on Route uh, or Sycamore Road, too close to the intersection, um, so the plan does show that being moved further to the northeast and made a right in, right out. It will not be a full access, right in, right out only. It's too close to the intersection for safety purposes to have a full access. Uh, the parking shown here, um, they do have uh, 65 parking spaces shown. The unified development ordinance based on the bedroom count would require 57 spaces, uh, so they do have adequate parking, a few extra actually. Um, the access on the west side of the building is going to be reestablished for an access there. Of course, Fisk is one way going eastbound. Um, they will have a, um, John mentioned some, uh, the background on the one and two bedroom, the reasoning for doing that. Um, they'll also have some uh, amenities. Um, they indicate in the summary dedicated mail and parcel room for receiving packages. Also a tenant lounge, exercise room, outdoor patio, and natural gas grill. In looking at this, uh, as they go forward, 
They're going to request a plan development residential zoning, PDR. They'll need some waivers to the ordinance. Um, and I just highlighted a few that uh, we did uh, uh, note here in the uh, memo. There's a 40 foot, 30 foot buffer area adjacent to lower density residential. So if it's a uh, multifamily zoning next to a low density single family, there's a 30 foot buffer. So obviously they cannot, you know, they're restricted on the site uh, parameters, the width. So they'll request a waiver on that. Um, they do have the parking lot on the east side at about 10 feet from the property line. The detention area will be here. There needs to be more engineering to take a look at that. Um, there's a 10-foot parking uh, setback on Sycamore Road. They have about uh, 5 to 10 feet on there. Um, again, they need the width for the drive aisles to, they're kind of constrained in where they can, you know, put the parking. The parking's still got to meet the design requirements for width. Aisles got to be 24 foot wide. So they're trying to fit that in. Uh, there's some perimeter setbacks for parking that they'll slightly be within and of course in landscaping with the reduced parking setbacks will probably have less landscaping but do plan to landscape around the perimeter site and um, in that buffer area to the east with a single family probably propose a, a fence would be a good idea along that stretch too for privacy and also uh, for more you know people avoiding to cut through lots. So staff has taken a preliminary look at this uh, with outside agencies. No major issues regarding that. They need to evaluate the stormwater management on the site as they go the next step. Uh, vehicle access points, as noted, will need to be looked at closer. And they need to do analysis on the access roads to determine the impacts on Sycamore Road and Fisk Avenue. But uh, again, the access on Sycamore Road will be moved further east and made a right in, right out. So they got to get further away from that intersection and I did show uh, in your packet some uh, what a, that's the uh, looking from FIS and you can see the uh, area where they're going to push that drive to the back parking lot. These are some I think from the realtors uh, aerial 3D or drone photos. They're showing that site. Uh, you can see the current access is too close to the intersection so they're going to move that down here make it right in right out which will be safer. This is the back of the building, the building looking out towards Sycamore Road. And this is a photo from the inside. And that's a current access on Sycamore Road showing the proximity to Sycamore Road is pretty close. Again, uh, looking down Sycamore Road from First Street, the access is right here. So just some images that were in your packet uh, just showing the site. So um, again, no um, motions required. We did get uh, some comments from the public. Uh, in your packet, there was an email from John and Margaret uh, Delano indicating support of the project. They own the apartment buildings that um, right adjacent to the site, just to the west and south of that across FIS, they own those two apartments. They indicated support for the project. And since the packets were posted on Thursday, the agenda, we did get a couple emails um, over the weekend. And I'm not sure if they're here tonight, but um, first one was from uh, Mr. Gary Heller of uh, 521 DeKalb Avenue, which is right here. He indicated um, it's a backyard adjoins the property, uh, concerned about the quietness of the neighborhood with a large parking lot. He noted and provided a photo that there's uh, nice large trees right behind his lot that are on the subject site and just had a question if they could be saved. Um, the plan does show his lot is right up in here, so he backs up to the detention area. And I, indic I did respond and the copies provided the commission that uh, would try and do everything to save the trees. It would depend on the grading needed for the detention area. But uh, as Mr. Saucer indicated, there's intent to save the trees on the site if possible. Uh, there's no reason to take them down. So uh, then we also received an uh, email from a few more questions and comments from Mr. Nathan Books of Nathan Liz right next door. 
right here at 201 Fisk. And I don't know if he's here tonight. He said he may be able to come, but it doesn't look like it. But anyway, he had a, I'll just summarize the comments. He noted the density of 32. He asked, uh, you know, how's it compared to surrounding apartments? Um, the surrounding apartments do have fewer units, but they're on smaller lots. So the actual density, the dwelling units per acre for this site is actually lower than some of the adjoining apartments because they have fewer apartments, but they're on a smaller lot. So uh, this project's about 24.5 dwelling units per acre. Some of the other apartment units is south of on Fisk or to the west. Uh, 28 and a half dwelling units an acre, 29, 23 dwelling units an acre. So uh, they're very comparable to the density of surrounding apartment buildings. Uh, also brought up the issue of the fence uh, planned or uh, requested a fence be uh, provided along the east side of the site. Um, as you can see, he's right adjoining the property and was concerned about cut through traffic, people walking through and just overall uh, more of a security along there and privacy. So uh, we'll recommend a fence be put up there along with the landscaping uh, to buffer those areas further. Uh, rooftop patio was uh, some of the renderings uh, Mr. Saucer provided. Showed a possible uh, patio um, on the upper levels here. I guess that may show it a little better. Here's a house that uh, Mr. Books lives in. Concerned about just the noise of an outdoor patio uh, with people up there. Uh, Mr. Saucer could respond, but he indicated that, uh, that uh, that's not a priority with the patios. He's still looking at those, but that patio on the east end is not a priority. I don't know if you want to Correct. go into that, that yeah, further. Uh, I think the artist got a little excessive with the patio renderings there. Mm -hmm. uh, her goal is to have at least one, but uh, the end to the east is likely not where that one would go. Yeah. And the final was this, I think, uh, a, um, come back to the site plan here. Had a comment about, uh, looked like uh, there was an AD ramp uh, going to the side of the building on the east side, which is not correct. That was a setback there. So the ADA accessible would be at the rear of the building. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was just more of a misprint on the plan. So. I did respond back to his email um, regarding these, so, but uh, those were included that came after the agenda packet, so. Okay. Com applicants are looking for comments, uh, feedback from the uh, commission and the public. Thank you. Um, comments, questions from the commission? Uh, we're, yeah, I'm going to work through the commission first and then we'll draw people up. Sure. <clears throat> I mean, personally, I like the idea uh, simply because, I, again, I think that the architecture in DeKalb is, is tremendously important um, and preserving it as much as we can. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to tear things down and, and build something that's, you know, slightly generic. But, you know, the, you're right that the building has good bones and it's, it, it's a nice, uh, it's interesting how it's set into a neighborhood, but it's, but it's also a nice um, touch at the end of that street, too. So. Um, from an architectural standpoint, uh, I, I think it's a great idea. I'm, I'm glad that somebody is finally, um, you know, ready to press the button and try to move forward with it. I know a couple of, a couple of plans came through and didn't work out, um, but yeah, I would be interested to see, you know, again, in addressing all the people, all the comments of the people in the area as well. Um, I would point out too that that for the residents there. Um, I appreciate your concern. I certainly do, um, I, but I, you know, it was always, I guess, assumed that something was going to go there. So. Um, anybody else have any comments? I like what I'm seeing. Yeah, um, yeah th th it would be an excellent use of that old building. I've lived within a couple of blocks of it pretty much since I moved to DeKalb in 94. Um, and I had friends who, uh, when Steve Irving built those houses on Fisk, they were, they were there right away. And, and uh, when the school left, it, there was a lot of well, what's going to happen to this building? This would be a really, really nice use. Um, I like seeing old stuff kept and um, improved and, and preserved um, in the right ways. So, no, this is a good direction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I agree. I have a question. Um, so, John, in terms of just to answer Nathan's questions, I think we answered most of them. But Nathan Books, he said, is there going to be a fence 
Dan, did I hear correct that there would be a fence required on the east lot line? So I think it's not determined just yet, but I'm certainly amenable to uh, working with him and staff on the preference if it's a fence or if it's landscaping. So okay. yeah, the and, ordinance and dictates a buffer, so that could be landscaping, a fence, combination thereof. Okay, so it'll so, be something that, to address uh, number yeah. two in uh, Nathan's email. Mm -hmm. And then, did I hear you correct that the, the patio is not determined on, in terms of which rooftop you would use? Well, I think there's a lot of flat roofs there, and I think the artist's rendering kind of put railings on all of them for an architectural purpose, but then also showed people on numerous ones, um, but it's not our intent to have multiple patios. Uh, really, we're just kind of looking to probably just have one, maybe two, if okay. it lends itself, but most likely just one. Yeah, I mean, it makes more sense. You'd put it on the side where the drive is, as opposed to on the, I guess it would be the east side of the building. And then, um, you know, my concern is the 32 units. I mean, I remember back 20 years ago, we were in that area, we were tearing down the Fisk and the Pond area places because the density was too much. So how does this relate to the density back 20 years ago when we uh, tore down the houses on Fisk and the apartments there? Well, I can't recall what the density was there. Bill was pretty familiar with that, but the density compared, as I noted, with the surrounding apartments to the west and south yeah. in terms of dwelling units per acre is comparable. It's comparable, okay. Yeah. Uh, I could comment professionally and personally on that. Uh, in 1971, I moved into the Hayes Flats. It's the last flats that are still standing on the south side of Fisk, just a little bit east of this area. Um, and while I was there, I lived, it was a five flat, uh, four flat turned into a five uh, creative uh, um, design by the, by the owner. And uh, we filled that place with graduate students and uh, there were three or four people to, to a two bedroom apartment. So uh, the, the professionally I can say because I was involved as the uh, head of the building and development department when the Fisk Avenue idea uh, was first piloted and through the, the TIF program, it was the first major TIF uh, project in the city of DeKalb and then a city manager in the early 90s. Uh, um, a, a lot of heavier density around the corner on DeKalb Avenue. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, so uh, I, I, it, it wouldn't, begin to approach what we used to have. Okay. Uh, and it was uncontrolled too, so it, 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 it was uh, an area that uh, existed long before zoning. Uh, our modern zoning was in place in the city of DeKalb. I mean, the flats were built in the 1890s, 18, late 1880s, uh, or 1890s, excuse me. So uh, I, I think this is in the direction of uh, and I don't want to enter this conversation because it eventually comes to me and the council, but I'll just say in the direction of uh, a more uh, thoughtful density. Okay. All right. And then the last question is, uh, did, can you tell, John, I mean, these trees that were submitted by the other neighbor, do you know if they will be preserved or? Um, well, you said that was pending the, the pond, right? The drainage? At, at yeah. this point, I, I just don't know where okay. the tree is up against that particular neighbor. I don't know. Okay. Does the I'm assuming there are parameters for yeah. a detention pond in relation to the amount of square footage of the so parking lot. To develop lot. a preliminary engineering plan and the size of detention to take care of the stormwater in the site, and that will dictate uh, the slope of the detention pond, how deep it will be, how close to the edge of the property and the tree. But um, you know, if it's right on the line, it's more than likely could be saved. So the plan's got to be developed more determined. At this level, mm -hmm. we, just, yeah. we just can't. Okay. Yeah. So I have a quick question about the parking lot plan. So are you planning then on um, only coming in from, would it be uh, northbound? It's so like northbound in, northbound out. So it's going to be like right turn in, right turn only out. Is there going to be a left, a southbound entrance? Or? No, on, on Sycamore Road, uh, engineering has determined that you'll only be able to turn in if you're heading north on Sycamore Road, and you'll only be able to leave heading north. Okay. Just due to the proximity to the intersection, the stoplight, just not enough room to safely turn left 
although there was a curb cut there much closer, um, certainly I understand, you know, that was probably put in 25 years ago, and at some point they just can't shut off access to a property, but, and that's where it was, but these are the times when we redevelop something that one of the positives that comes out of this, while it's costly, is better traffic flow for the community. Any other questions by council or uh, commission? Okay. Um, with that, then I will open it up to um, public questions. Uh, again, if you'll, as you come forward, um, if you'll state your name and your address and. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Cliff Cleland. I live at 518 South 2nd Street in DeKalb. And as I said, I've been in this town since 1962. Seen a lot of changes. Love the downtown. It's had its ups and its downs. I hope to see it go up again. I, I applaud uh, Mr. Saucer for his work and his attempt to turn this this old beautiful building into something that's uh, you know livable. That, that people are there. That there's a, a buzz about it. That's 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 good. I like that. <clears throat> I had some questions. Uh, looking at the story in the Chronicle. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> the one bedroom units are 650 square feet and the, the two bedrooms are 900 square feet. Uh, how do those numbers compare with some of the other um, apartment buildings in the downtown area? The new, we have several new ones here. How do those units compare? Are we looking at smaller or larger or Dan, I think, the same? Dan, didn't, I think you addressed as far as the density is concerned that it's similar to the surrounding properties, correct? Mm -hmm. Some of the surrounding properties, I don't know if you're referring to some of the other well, ones, newer ones? The newer, I'm thinking of the newer ones that have been built in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, the high-end high uh, apartments that are... And, <clears throat> and uh, the other question I have is occupancy rate. Have you done a study of the occupancy rate of those apartment uh, complexes? Are, are, are they close to filled up or are, are we looking at? Well, the most recent ones, uh, particularly done by John Pappas, are fully occupied. What was, I didn't hear? They're fully occupied. Okay, yeah, that's a good sign, okay. Um, I did have a few, I'd anticipating a mm -hmm. somewhat of a question, sure. similar okay. question on the square footage. Sure. I didn't get all of them down, but Isaac Sweets, uh, of course, on his mm -hmm. Sycamore Road, um, fully furnished. Mm -hmm. Those are fully furnished. And they're smaller, 420 square feet to 483 square feet. Um, a two bedroom, I think, 720 square feet. Um, Chuck Shepard, who got approval for some uh, apartments at Hillcrest and Route 23 in the former office buildings that went through the commission. It uh, looks like he's they're around 800 to 900 square feet. Pretty similar. Uh, <clears throat> similar. Rista Residence, which was just approved by the city on Barbara Green. Again, fully furnished, one bedroom, 700 square feet. So that, just to give a okay. rough idea. And did you mention occupancy rate? Or are we... Are well, we, Rista's not constructed yet, but the... No, I know. This one Isaac Suites is fully it's occupied. It's empty now. Yeah, but most of these are, the, are fully occupied? Okay, well who are we looking at for people moving into the, the apartment complex? Who, who, is, who is the, the audience that you're trying to attract? I think the yeah. applicant could, could respond to that. John. Anyone? Okay. I, I, I don't think there's been a vast majority of... If we could go to the mic, John, just so sure. we can yeah. pick that up on the video. Yeah. Um, Sorry, really, this is open to anyone. I think there's uh, a certainly, um, e even if you look at how much our town is growing, mm -hmm. there haven't been massive, massive apartments or housing built in quite some years. And I think if you've lived here long enough, you've seen, or maybe, you know, if you don't know, if you're in this industry, um, we did have an occupancy dip there for a while, but as time has gone on and no new, new, new major new construction, um, really, we've, seen that fill up and you know as you a testament to the new stuff that's been built in the last couple of years being 100 percent full i think it shows that slow controlled growth that there is a need for it but there's no one specific target but okay okay all right um let's see let's see uh, the heating and 
cooling comes up to, to, to my mind when I see these 10 to 12 foot ceilings. Um, it would seem that if, if, if I live in a place that has eight foot ceilings, so a 12 foot ceiling is, you know, another third. Heating and cooling, is that taken into consideration with these high ceilings? Can you put drop ceilings in or, or am I? I think, that you, you know, as it pertains to, I guess, more developed questions, Mr. Cleland, I, we are just looking at this okay. as just a preliminary sketches. Oh, sure. Okay. And so, uh, yeah. All right. you know, as, yeah. as the project progresses, we'll definitely see more of the, yeah. the, okay. the prints, as right. it were. Okay. I, I was asking, oh, this is the one, this is the thing that jumped out at me as, as I read this article. Uh, Mr. Saucer, in 2017, he sold some rental properties, now known as Hunter Star Properties, on DeKalb's north side to Evanston-based Hunter Properties. Well, we all know what happened there. That was a disaster. And you wouldn't do anything like that again, would you? <laughs> I mean, I'm not putting you on the spot here. Uh, I think you're confusing some of the properties that I sold with some of the other ones that had issues. Okay. All the properties that I sold to Hunter became Hunter Star. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the issues that that company had Hunter okay. were other apartment buildings that right. they acquired that had been run in the ground for decades. Yeah. Every, all the units that I had sold are still operating in very good quality okay. apartments. That answers my question. I think I have no more questions. Uh, yep. Let's see. You, mean, you mentioned the neighbors uh, uh, the, uh, giving their approval, the, the next door neighbors. Are, are any neighbors saying, we don't want this property? We don't want to, to build here? Have you heard anything like that? Anything negative? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cleland. People that don't know me, my name is Robert Carlson. I live at 3 Wedgwood Cove in uh, DeKalb. And my history is that uh, I owned Carlson Appraisal for 42 years. And within that time period, I did valuations on a significant number of multifamily apartments in the city of DeKalb, of which many of these assignments were properties owned by the Saucer family. The, these properties were new construction, existing properties uh, as an investment, and remodeled multifamily properties. And during that uh, period of time of 42 years, I also did uh, properties in Macomb and Carbondale for uh, uh, banks that uh, were uh, working with the saucers. And it was interesting when I was in Macomb, the city of Macomb sold uh, vacant parcels to the saucers for development because they really thought very highly of them. And in Carpendale, I spoke to the assistant city manager and his comment was, we like these guys. Uh, currently, I, uh, I own 302 apartment units in an office building at 901 North 1st Street in which we have our office for Riverside Properties. And if you could do the aerial, Dan. Um, on 2nd Street, directly across the street from, uh, from the subject parcel is uh, 427 and 417. Those properties I own. And then on 1st Street, right next to Delano's, there's a 418. And I own that property, and that is part of that parcel. Now, that has 30 units in it of the three buildings. Mm -hmm. And I would say with 30, uh, 32 units, that uh, is very compatible what, uh, with the mix that, that I have. I also <coughs> own just uh, directly north of the Elwood House on the other side of that uh, wooded area, the Windsor Apartments. And I think everybody has driven by the Windsor Apartments. That's that building that kind of sits at an angle and has a very aesthetic uh, um, location right across from the school. So we all know that also. You know, I was saying I. I should correct myself when I say that. It's my wife, my son, and I. So, um, 
And then we own uh, Hillcrest Place Apartments, which is just north of where the subject is, and uh, we own the Elwood View Apartments. And one, one thing about uh, one of the questions was the mix, uh, if it should be uh, two and one bedrooms, and I find that, that both, both in my previous profession and, and uh, my uh, uh, business now is that, that that's a, a perfect mix. Uh, the Elwood View, which is at the corner of Augusta and First Street, is the, uh, the kind of Tudor-looking complex, and that has a mix of one bedrooms and two bedrooms. So, you know, I... Okay, so... Um... So, my opinion with regard to uh, John Saucer. Um, and like I say, over 42 years, I've worked with John for quite often, and uh, I've I kn I've known him very well. His son, or my son, and him, and he are the same age. So anyway, I want to say that John Saucer has the experience in all factors of property ownership, both locally and statewide. And I find that to be very important with regards to this uh, project. Another factor, John Saucer is a prudent, and I capitalize that, he is a prudent property owner. And in the appraisal process, you know, you have potentially two kinds of uh, ownership. You have a prudent ownership, and you have a less than prudent ownership. And uh, if you want to see the problem properties, you can usually identify them as being less than prudent. So it's been my experience that he has designed new properties or remodeled existing properties that meet the highest and best use of the site. Meeting the highest and best use. In the real estate field, that is your, your number one measurement if you meet the highest and best use of that site. I spent 42 years looking at what the highest and best use is. So. Um, in conclusion, the Fisk Avenue property requires all of John Saucer's knowledge and experience to improve the property in the neighborhood. And I can <coughs> honestly say, having the properties that I have, that it's an improvement of the neighborhood is very, very important. And then based on my uh, lengthy experience with, uh, with John in the appraisal field and also the investment field, I give my total approval to this project. And one final comment, uh, and this is kind of humorous, but uh, on the sketch it has traffic in both Rex and on Fisk Avenue. And it, uh, will the uh, city be using its police power to make Fisk Avenue having traffic in both directions? And if that is the case, I have, I have approval of this potential to change. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure he appreciates the endorsement. Would anyone else like to come forward? Please. Hello, I'm Marilyn Cleland at 518 South 2nd Street in DeKalb. I, uh, I'm glad to hear what I've heard tonight. Uh, I have been concerned. Uh, uh, the connection, however indirect with the 100 properties, really bothered me because I was called upon as a resident of DeKalb to, to be in some of the 100 properties, and they were not managed. They were, they think, they were not kept up. It was imprudent management, to say the very least. A cynical, as a matter of fact, management with the residents there. Uh, and and I, I don't want that to happen to our city, to anybody in our city. And all are welcome, as you say, in the apartments. That is good. So I'm glad, and you are a resident, a lifelong resident of DeKalb. And I'm presuming that you probably were going to stay here. It's this business of buying apartments and the manager, the person who's really the owner, is gone far away. Uh, and I, 
I, I hope that you will stay here, Mr. Saucer, <laughs> and be with your apartments. It is a lovely building. I like it very much, I, and I wish it well. And you, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Please. Gary Erickson, I live at 508 DeKalb Avenue and have lived there for close to 20 years. The character of the neighborhood is quiet, and I think that's largely due to Fisk Avenue being a one-way street, um, and would urge that uh, that never be changed, uh, partly for the peace of mind of the neighborhood, but also there are a growing number of children in the community, and I think that a two-way street Fisk Avenue could create uh, some kind of danger. Uh, so I would urge that for the sake of the neighborhood, we always keep uh, Fisk Avenue uh, one way, heading east from 1st to 4th Street. Another concern is that we do have a school zone on Sycamore Road, and so I'm, I'm glad to hear about the uh, right in, right out, um, uh, driving into the um, uh, parking lot. Uh, and would urge that um, there be some kind of effort made to make sure that uh, that school zone is uh, remains safe uh, for the children who uh, do cross Sycamore Road and um, often travel happily through uh, the neighborhood uh, making their uh, teenage sounds which are mostly delightful. Um, so I would uh, stand in, in favor of the project as someone who can see the uh, project from uh, my front to porch, my front window, and just simply urge that we do all we can to preserve the character of the neighborhood by keeping Fisk Avenue one way and preserving that um, school zone uh, as kind of a sacred space so that children are safe uh, coming back and forth. Thank you for your comments, Gary. Anyone else? Good evening. Hi. My name is Judith Rodeo. I reside at 222 Sycamore Road with my husband, Eric. And our concern is, as all are welcome, is low income. Some of the low income can bring, they bring problems to an area. And not that we want to be discriminatory against anyone. But those are concerns that we have, you know. We're also concerned, will our property taxes go up? Uh, where the garbage is gonna go? Where, you know, there are some, some unanswered questions. We are in support of doing something for the building, um, which is much better than what it's doing currently now. But those are concerns. Um, as I, I, like you said, all are welcome, but low-income housing can cause a problem. Section 8 vouchers. There are some lovely people that unfortunately need to use that, but there are some people that abuse it. And pot smoking, that's another problem. Yes, it's legal. Is it legal federally? Yes. But that's, it, it comes with an odor. And that, that's a big problem for me. We are in a school area, and we do not encourage the use of any sort of drug use, legal or not. But that is a huge concern. Would, you know, would that be allowed in the building? Smoking is not allowed in most buildings. Pot is, pot's to be smoked. I mean, as a concern that I have, I mean, how do you, how do you personally feel about something like that? Uh, Mr. Saucer, do you want to, I think we can tackle two things. Just by virtue of what you're expecting to probably put on the price tag as far as rent is concerned, I think you're gonna get nice upstanding citizens. And um, as far as the uh, smoking aspect, again, I assume this is gonna be a non-smoking facility. Um, this project is, uh, these, these are going to be market rate apartments. Um, as far as um, smoking or non-smoking, I'm with you. I'm not a fan of marijuana, but our state and has decided that it's legal, so it's, it's created some challenges. As a property manager, it's created challenges. I'm with you that um, while some people can do it legally, not everybody likes the odor. Um, my experience is, even if you, you know, you rent a car, it says no smoking. You um, rent a hotel room, they say no smoking or no pets. My experience as a property manager is they're going to do what they're going to do anyway. So to try and tell them no smoking 
has been fruitless to try and some, tell somebody no, no pot smoking is, is essentially fruitless. So um, I could, you know, tell you that's what's what going to happen, but I don't think it's going to be true. So I think the goal of having nice new market rate apartments, active management, um, in my experience, active management is what really keeps the problems at bay. Uh, you don't rent to problem tenants or that have evictions or so forth. Um, and so that's really the key of keeping good property um, is active management. So that's our goal and that's how I like to operate uh, buildings. So I don't, I hope that alleviates some of your concerns. I share them and I agree with you, but uh, I'm an active property manager. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, oh. Uh, hello, I'm Jacob Merrill. I live on 900 Crane Drive. And I want to start out saying that as like a student at NIU, I absolutely love the idea of this plan. And as someone who's studying economics and especially land use economics, I want to say this plan is definitely the right move in terms of growing DeKalb and creating a sustainable economically and environmentally um, community. Um, but I will bring one critique, which is about the parking lot. Because as you mentioned, I think you said it's 57 parking spots are required for this apartment building legally, um, but it's only about 30 units. And that feels like overkill, because that is, even though there is some parking lot there, there's still like a nice field. And I feel like having to put all of that extra park, excuse me, that extra parking is a waste of that space and causing, you know, issues with having to create that retention pond and everything. And so I think if the city would have some way that they'd be able to give a waiver to reduce that number and that that parking lot can be designed to be smaller, that that would make the environment better and also solve like the noise issues because the biggest source of noise is going to be from car traffic in the area. And so reducing that by reducing parking, I think would definitely go a lot towards making the community more like holistic um, and sustainable. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Dan, I think, well, and to, to your point too though, um, yeah, I think it was 32 um, units, and then I think you're working under the assumption that that would be one person per unit, and some of those are two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So there is a necessity, and, and obviously through city code that we've developed, um, for a, a reasonable density of parking versus residences. So um, I, I, like you, would love to see more green space and less asphalt, but um, I think there probably is a rational necessity for that. Yeah, we'll look at that with the applicant. Uh, we ran into this issue of maybe too much parking with Arista residents, where the applicant actually proposed less parking than what was required and then increased it a little bit. So 57 is required, but it's one and a half space for every one bedroom and two and a half spaces for every two bedroom, um, counting for guests and et cetera. Sure. But we're looking at maybe reducing that, but uh, the applicant did put 62 spaces on the plan, so they've got to be comfortable with there. But we'll we're open to taking a look if it's you know if the applicant and our research indicates that it's uh, maybe too much. Yeah, it would help, up, particularly on this site, to reduce some parking if sure. possible and add some more green space because it is tight and there's not much for setbacks. So, uh, one thing I want to add, uh, due to a, a property being vacant for so long and not the, being maintained like we all take care of our homes. The misconception is that it looks like it's a big green field. That's actually all parking lot. It just had weeds and leaves and debris grow in it and get captured there and be a dirty catch basin for years. But there's actually the vast majority that is already parking lot with curb and gutter. And so that water is already going into the, into the storm system. So by kind of upgrading that and using really essentially what is there, um, you know, it's actually going to be better for the stormwater system because we can slow that detention a little bit better. Um, but I just want to clarify that misconception because it does look like grass from the area, but if you walked it and actually looked out there, it's an asphalt parking lot under the weeds. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, please. Again, Marilyn Cleland. 
I, I, I can't help but uh, respond to this question about the parking lot, and I would only say that I hope that you'll be as environmentally uh, sensitive as you can be at my observation, frankly, from China, was uh, parking lots that had grass growing, that they were, they were small squares. Bricks, a brick with holes among, you walk by one line, you just see bricks, you turn around, it's a grass field. And the water is absorbed the into down. the lawn, the line, uh, into the ground, and off. not run, run off. It's I we I don't know why we have I have never once seen these in the United States, and I've been all over the United States. But it seemed to me brilliant and attractive. And there was that rain going right into the ground where it should. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Glenn. Anyone else? If not, I will just close it for discussion at this point. And I believe we are have considerations on the comprehensive plan with some discussion. Thank you, Mr. Saucer. And if uh, is this on? Good. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Hello. And if you're not here for the comprehensive plan uh, discussion and you want to go, you can do so now <laughs> without hurting anybody's feelings. Dan's going too, I guess. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you for uh, taking this on. Uh, as you well know, we haven't uh, upgraded our plan formally since 2005. Usually these plans are five to seven years in duration and we've gone through a couple different growth spurts uh, since 2005 and although uh, I have to say the plan has held up in, in certain areas in certain respects and in other areas it hasn't uh, because we can't foresee the future uh, as accurately as we would like. We have before you tonight a document and you're probably wondering well, how did we get to a document already? Wait a minute we haven't talked about this. Well. Uh, if, you, if you look at it, and I'm, I'm going to just walk us very briefly through the first couple chapters, it's, it's by design uh, titled Inventory and Analysis. So what are the data that we know about where we are now and how we got to where we are? And uh, the Section 3, Goals and Objectives, is not meant to be presumptuous, and I alluded to this at the last meeting. It's, it's meant to show you a format and also to throw some ideas out just to kind of get the juices going. It's not uh, by any means in intended to uh, rob you of, of the, the creativity that, that you want to bring to this. And, and ultimately, we're going to go to the public in some informal sessions. Uh, at this point, we've, we've logged uh, two different sessions. We'll come up with the times and dates still being discussed with the school district, probably one at the middle school on the north side and one at the middle school on the south side and just to make it convenient for people and if we have more sessions it'll probably be before you here in this chamber uh, and uh, then ultimately uh, with a recommendation one way or another from you and after we've had maybe different drafts of different chapters we'll go to the council for again a, a, a working session and then after that work toward a more formal approval and we see all this happening over the next 90 plus days probably it'll probably be late summer before we get to an action agenda at the council level so we're not trying to rush this even though we've been uh, waiting for a long time uh, it's it's right to do it thoughtfully uh, you'll note at the very beginning if you had a chance uh, we, we buried you with a lot of information here just last what was it Wednesday or Thursday I guess it was uh, I've already got some acknowledgments in here. That's a, a placekeeper, although I don't think I'm wrong in saying that all of you are, are going to give this uh, your careful attention and that you'll be inviting public discussion. So I thought that was a pretty safe thing to say. Uh, the first chapter is an introduction. It's a lot of this and that, but uh, we just at the 
uh, city council level, we just did a, a new financial plan, a three-year financial plan. This information is about as fresh as we'll get. Uh, so if, if we want to take me to task on any of the dates and details, please do. Uh, I'm happy to try to address any questions you may have, but uh, this is a, a fairly, uh, uh, oh, uh, economical history. Uh, the point is, for somebody who's never been to DeKalb and is just sort of interested in DeKalb, uh, we, we just want to give them a snapshot. Here's, here's who we are, here's what we have been up to this point, going back to our earliest days of incorporation. Uh, then we get to the planning and development activity that's occurred since the last plan was adopted. And I want to thank Dan especially for uh, knocking this out, which took weeks and weeks. He went back through all the council agendas and all the plan commission agendas, and I think this is as complete as can be. And at the end, when we get to page 22, and I gave you all a, a copy of where we are to date. There will be other copies. Uh, uh, you see uh, some planning issues. This is not uh, meant to uh, anticipate all the possible issues that you might articulate. But uh, these are, uh, from at least the staff level, some very general issues which need to be addressed in this plan and any plan. And we've talked a little bit about this, and I've said somewhat jokingly, uh, if, if you would, uh, as we start working particularly on Chapter 4, which needs to be fleshed out, that'll be a, a major focus for this commission. You need to get out uh, and, uh, to the four corners of the city and look back, and with your plan, current plan in hand, uh, current land uses, and, and determine whether uh, this is what we want DeKalb to look like or if you're too far or you're not far enough out in whatever direction. Our planning jurisdiction by state law is a mile and a half from any point on the corporate limit. So it's a jagged line, it's not a perfect circle. As we look, at, just as an example, if you look to the northwest side, we have a large area which right now is uh, for the passerby just uh, corn and, and soybeans, uh, more corn than, corn than soybeans, but uh, that's the Iron Gate uh, development area. It's, it's uh, been annexed and zoned, but uh, no final plats, and it'll probably be a while before we see something like that. Uh, as you look a little bit further west and a little bit further north uh, at the intersection, say, of any Glidden and Bethany, uh, what do you see happening from that point going north and west? So these are questions you might ask yourself. The East is sort of spoken for, isn't it? I mean, we've sort of defined uh, some developments south of Lincoln Highway as, as uh, being more industrial office research and so forth as you get out to the fringe of the corporate limits. And as you look on, on the Peace Road corridor to the East, again, uh, the zoning that we've had for since 2005 has been mostly toward the industrial side a little bit of commercial, there's a note of commercial at Pleasant and Peace, and as you go further north, I could see maybe at intersection, major uh, signalized inter intersections, some more commercial nodes. But the in-betweens are going to be broad areas of land that might be more interesting to a larger industrial firm. We don't know. That's for you to sort of script. Naturally, anything that you do script, and it does fall into the plan af after the council's approval, can be revised, but the, the point of the plan is that while you can revise the zoning, this is not zoning, this is, although it anticipates zoning in line with it, but this is the conceptual visionary part of it all. So uh, you don't undo the plan every month or every year, and, and uh, if there are major changes, then we have to go back through the process again and do an upgrade. When uh, I was in another community to the north, uh, in the early 2000s, we did three plans in seven years because that was when the, the avalanche of uh, housing hit and there were all kinds of concerns, other taxing bodies, uh, different points of view. 
And, but it made sense that we should all get together as a community and decide what we wanted to do. And we would do that, and we would feel pretty good about it. And two or three years later, oh, oh what about, what are we going to do? So it's a good process. Uh, we're envisioning uh, a plan of about five years' duration here. Uh, finally, and I'll shut up and, and, and yield to Dan for a couple of chapters. Uh, the inventory and analysis uh, has some, also some pictures here, which are just plug pictures. We'll do better, but I wanted to show you that we're hoping that this plan isn't just going to be a lot of words, that there will be some pictures that capture your imagination and what you think these words mean in a graphical way. Uh, but it's also a way for us to, to acknowledge that it's not just city government, it's other taxing bodies, it's other uh, integral components that make up our community on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, I have just taken you, believe it or not, to uh, page 42, and I'm going to yield to Dan. Oh, thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, chapter three uh, is the goals and objectives. Um, so I'll just go through these. Uh, I won't read each one, but just kind of give a little background or some of the major highlights of it. And um, it's broken down into um, uh, different elements. The first is community appearance. So, and each one kind of leads off with the introduction, kind of a little background of what we're talking about. And then there's a, a actual goal for it, and then objecti objectives uh, are listed after that are almost implementation strategies, or how do we get to the goal. So the first one with the um, community <coughs> appearance, uh, look at the reinvigorate a college town identity while promoting the expansion of the tax base and community oriented service and jobs. Something very kind of general, all encompassing, but a few to point out, uh, looking at the uh, TIF fund, of course we have a TIF 3, covers most of downtown and some of the corridors uh, out from there, east and west, looking to um, put that in place and a project coming up this year, and Bill maybe talk a little bit about, is the uh, reconfiguration of Route 38 through the downtown area, looking to reduce that from four lane down to three lanes with a center turn lane. That will increase the width of the sidewalks, be more pedestrian friendly, allow restaurants to have the outdoor seating uh, that many desire and have enough room for the uh, sidewalk. Um, that will also slow down the traffic because uh, it'd be a reduced you know, visibility as you drive. So one will want to slow down. So that's the intent there. Um, that's a big project. Um, I don't know if Bill wants to add to that or kind of the scheduling going on uh, this yeah, year. Yeah, uh, actually we, we go out to, uh, we open the bids on this Wednesday sometime in the afternoon. I can't remember now. I think it's 2 o'clock. And the bids, uh, well, first I'm going to be going like this when I look at the prices. Uh, but uh, if we'll find out uh, on, on Wednesday where we stand. Monday night the council will have it on their agenda for action. I might also just say, so we're going first to fourth, and that's partly a matter of the money at hand right now. It's also a matter of the fact this is owned by the state of Illinois, this, this uh, roadway. Um, IDOT, we've been a year and several months in uh, conversation with different levels of, of the uh, IDOT staff and, and engineering staff, and uh, uh, we have a we had a hard stop on the east, uh, both with budget and also with sort of the plan because of the, the uh, railroad crossing. <coughs> and at first in Lincoln for other reasons. Um, I think, and this is something I challenge you all to do too, is to think beyond today and where we might want to be in five years. And I foresee, I know we've been through different ripples of this, but I think from 4th to 7th is also another area that needs to be thought very creatively about. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here. And, and also, uh, if the identity of the town is as a college town, and I think we're a, we're a town with a college in it still in a lot of important respects, but we're going to have to physically and spatially link 
the downtown core, which we're trying to revive and re reinvigorate, with the area of the lagoon. Now, how do you do that? Uh, we've had different ideas, and some developers have, have put ideas out there. Uh, it's no accident that's still in the TIF, the corridor is, and two blocks either side. Uh, I think we should think creatively about what that should be, and I'll stop. But as, you're, as you put on your thinking caps, uh, any thoughts along those lines are welcome. But, but I think we need a ribbon of more than just light to connect those two pieces. And some of the more uh, additional objectives there, uh, looking at gateways into the city, making them uh, distinct, you know, with uniform uh, entryways, different roads. Um, I won't go through all these, but um, these deal with uh, everywhere from uh, urban design guidelines, which we'll go to in a little bit, um, addressing natural features, working with the park district, uh, greenways, open spaces, working with those. The second is uh, industrial development. Of course, that's been a big uh, growth lately. Uh, so it's recognizing all the uh, development down in Route 23, Girl Road, Peace Road. Um, so I think we want to, uh, the goal is to retain that in terms of quality and continue that and also uh, have it uh, a diverse type of industrial development. So industrial, we're gonna have that category pretty broad. That would be manufacturing, distribution, warehousing, data centers, and more of the industrial type uses. So it's kind of broad. The current plan from 05, if you look at it, had a broken down into a light industrial heavy and office and research. So if you look at the map, it's uh, pretty much all, uh, this industrial is all encompassing. So obviously uh, some key ones here with uh, cooperation with the economic development partners, promote the development of the city's southeast side, Gurler Road, Peace Road, north of I-88. Um, and jump to the map here, but um, so we're stretching the industrial. Uh, this is the, uh, it's hard without the aerial underneath, I understand, but um, this is Peace Road here, intersection with I-88. This is Meta and the Ferrara Amazon here, so, and the corporate limits are in black, so we're extending the industrial further. Out to the east to the, we have a boundary agreement with Cortland, so we're continuing the industrial development to that line we can't go any further east. So that does uh, include a lot of acreage that is vacant, so a lot of area for future industrial development. And um, also so a few items on here, the uh, TIF-1, of course, um, um, that does include some industrial areas along the Union Pacific Railroad corridor, Lincoln Highway further east, where there can be redevelopment there, so we wanna focus on that too. Uh, urban design guidelines address some industrial development um, and encourage other light industrial uses, including data centers, which we are, and other type of uses. I think uh, diversity is a big key there um, with the manufacturing, the warehousing, distribution, data centers, and none of their industrial uses. Um, commercial development, of course, the retail is, uh, you know, it's a nationwide issue with uh, we have some a lot of vacancies in a few of the strip centers, um, so I think uh, the objective here is to promote uh, the uh, community oriented commercial retail and service outlets. How do we do that? Um, uh, some focus on uh, further developing some of these uh, larger strip centers. I think uh, I think we have to add some language probably here, allowing a variety of uses, like we've done with uh, indoor self storage, climate control, and retail centers. Uh, Health center, you know, residential, other type uses, why retail is suffering, uh, or just make uh, the ability to have some large parking areas in these retail areas. So I think we have to look at some other options or other uh, possibilities for other uses too in these retail areas, but at the same time, promote these retail areas to make sure that they're still, when the things come around again, that they're viable, they're in good condition, and people wanna go there, so. Uh, looking at uh, one corridor we got to look at, uh, South 4th Street, from Taylor to Fairview. Uh, we're discussing maybe looking at an overlay district there. Uh, and the comp plan, we got to go through that uh, corridor. 
a little bit more and look at, uh, so the map is, um, and I'll go down to each section here in a bit, but um, a lot of work to be done left on that, but there's still, I think we uh, kind of set the standard. We look really at the corridor around there, but we have to uh, still go through almost parcel by parcel, neighborhood by neighborhood um, inside the city and take a look at the land use. We used an existing land use map to start it with, and then we had to look at each parcel almost to make sure we had the correct use on there. So things have changed over time, and everything's accurate. Um, but we're still working on that, but this is a pretty good start to it. Um, so any other goals? Let's see in the commercial. Uh, it's a pretty standard regarding this design, encouraging cross alignment uh, uh, centers that are developed across access, landscaping provisions. I think in there we should add some language regarding flexibility of landscaping. So each site's different. We've been doing this a little bit with uh, looking at a site and taking the quantity of landscaping required and applying it to the property where it makes sense the most and allowing on an administrative level to do that and through the commission's uh, review of it too. Uh, always looking at the list of commercial or permitted and special uses for commercial districts, um, trying to make it easier or, you know, if we have a special use that doesn't, it's really not impactful or hurtful, maybe we move that to a permitted use to make things a little bit easier for an applicant coming in. Uh, residential development, um, I think the big thing there is again diversity in the housing stock um, is key and affordability. So um, some of the objectives, preserve neighborhoods, uh, take a look at density. And on the land use plan, uh, we haven't put a density down in terms of residential. We have uh, three categories, low density, medium, and high. The current comp plan has uh, zero to four for low, uh, dwelling units per acre, medium is four to eight, and the high is eight to 12, 12 is the max. So, and you just saw with this concept plan we reviewed, we have densities of apartments way above that. So we may, if we want the higher density or affordable, maybe we increase that ceiling on the high density uh, to allow those with, you know, provisions of additional open space or something. Um, so we're still going through some of these. They're pretty standard. Uh, refers to the urban design guidelines again, which we'll go over. Um, and the next one is downtown enhancement, uh, which we've touched on a little bit with the work on Lincoln Highway coming up. Obviously, keep the downtown, the vitality of it. Um, use a TIF, enhance a uh, mix of uses. Uh, support the... Um, TIF funded, also included in that is the AIP program, Architectural Improvement Program, looking at to maintain that or even expanding it a little bit, some of the language or some of the ability to uh, expand the funds or what categories they can be used for. Uh, entryways, wayfinding, additional signage to help people around and around downtown, the parking areas and the, some of the uh, events like the um, Egyptian Theater and other attractions. Um, Streetscape, continuing it above or beyond Lincoln Highway to Locust and Grove Street to reduce some of the uh, overhead wires, you know, improvements to sidewalks, parking areas, landscaping, et cetera. Again, using the TIF 3 funds, uh, focusing uh, down by 3rd and Locust, former McCabe's building, and maybe areas uh, further east of that also. Uh, economic development, kind of an overall addressing the retail and commercial and industrial, uh, keeping that um, going, maintain the positive image for the city, working well with the DC, EDC, the chamber, um, promoting these sites along AD, I-88 and Peace Road, and working with the uh, other taxing districts regarding tax rates, um, and also the uh, and then finally, we go into the community facilities, uh, working with other taxing bodies, and making sure our, uh, the community facilities are up to standard. Um, and natural features, it talks about uh, open spaces and uh, green belts, and um, really, and I'll go into the map here in a second, creating a ag land use are really emphasizing that in certain areas within the mile and a half. Um, forcing landscape standards, 
good setbacks, good buffers. We, a lot of these we do have the standards already in the UDO guidelines. I think we just need to look at them and refine them a little bit so they make sense. And from my experience, I think a lot of it um, does with this flexibility or the ability to, to kind of take the standard and apply it to a site and have the flexibility to, you know, move the landscaping around or just make it, the standards fit to a particular site, I think is really helpful. And we can do that through the plan development process. And um, I think we just need to fine tune that. Transportation, um, again, a big key. Uh, continue to work with DSATs. We have a uh, mass transit facility that we're working on a siting process right now for that, uh, which will serve the community for a long time. And you have the other objectives listed there. So um, this is a future land use map draft. This is the current 2005 map. And I think the first thing we looked at, Bill and I, uh, you know, with, in 2005, things were going very strong in terms of development. And uh, if you look at the area here, um, current boundaries you can kind of see, but the intent was to really, for the mile and a half, was a, all low density, single family with commercial areas. And the eggs areas were just little pieces at the very edge that were allowed. So, very expansive single family, way over projected. Uh, but at that time, we were growing quite a bit. So I think the idea was bring that amount of residential single family in closer. That's not going to happen. Plus, we have a lot of lots that are already platted or approved zoning-wise that are vacant. That's And there's a ch chart, on page uh, 26, if you look at the bottom, page 26. This, the developments building division put this together where they uh, have the developments with uh, lots available. Iron Gate, the big one, now that was approved on a preliminary basis in zoning. It was not final platted. Uh, but there's a, over 1,100 platted lots there. Not platted, but approved lots. And we have some open uh, vacant lots still in the Bridges, River Mist, the Knolls, South Point Greens, and Devonair Farms. And it breaks down between single family and attached. So, single family, if you take out uh, Iron Gate, there's 182 vacant lots, single family. And attached single family townhomes, there are 120 av available lots without Iron Gate. So, and then you add Iron Gate, that's quite a bit more. So, I guess the key is uh, we have a lot of lots already available in the city. Now, most of those are. Uh, lots they're going to have higher end homes on, um, you know, bridges and uh, some of those are higher end. So, so what we did, we took a look at the um, each area, and I'll go to the northwest side and just briefly what we're looking at. So, this is the uh, Bridges of River Mess, Bethany Road, First Street. Um, so, some of the vacant areas there, we're filling them in with multifamily, which is already proven in single family, but. This is a corporate limit line, so we're not going any further out in this particular area with any development. So this would be ag. So the mile and a half, we do have planning jurisdiction, meaning if the county proposes something, has something come into them in the unincorporated area, the mile and a half, we get the chance to object to that zoning, whatever it is. Now they have a 40 lot acre minimum lot area for their homes, so they're not going to approve any subdivision unincorporated. They've had that policy for 20, 25 plus years. So, so in terms of areas that could be annexed into this city, so we did add a few. Um, not till you get down. This is the uh, just give orientation. The county health facility here. This is the site of the blue is institutional. This is the first United Methodist Church site, just approved. So we do uh, these unincorporated areas, kind of filling in with single family. This is Eden's Gardens. We did add the area to the west, one parcel, kind of west is a potential annexation. Again, you don't know if these be annexed ever. That depends on the land ownership and uh, what the demand is. But we do have a lot of other areas. This area right here is the Iron Gate. So we just took the approved preliminary plan and put it on there. With the open space, the, they have two kind of densities, a medium and low density residential. They even had a school site and some parks in there. So we just took that approved preliminary plan from 06 and put it, that's, that's Iron Gates area. But we have larger areas that are not in this city that uh, more infill that could be certainly developed as 
a single family. Uh, we have some multifamily areas. This is the um, suburban apartments, not in the city, but they have some other acreage that's owned by that uh, entity that could be some multifamily. We also, in this area, recognizing the AGN plan that was approved just a few years ago in their land use. So we have the commercial here. And the thing on the past plans, uh, we have a lot of corridor studies. They're noted at the beginning of the comp plan, so we still recognize those. Some have been a little dated, uh, but those are not, they don't go away. We try to incorporate their main policies there, uh, if they're still valid and land use, particularly AGN, the most recent ones, so we try to, we're recognizing that plan still in the land use designations. Um, <clears throat> going to the uh, southwest side, again, we're adding, um, this look at the areas this, uh, touching this city, so this is uh, um, the Knowles, Devonair Farms, and we, did add in areas for potential annexation is low density right next to it. Down at Fairview and Annie Glenn, we have the commercial uh, here, which is on our current comp plan and some residential there too. So we allowed that, but these areas out here, egg, continued as egg area. So we reduced the amount of area that we're projecting to be annexed a single, quite a bit actually. Uh, the south uh, east part of the city, this is the Tollway Oasis, so you have an industrial meta and um, Amazon Ferreira, and then uh, as I showed a little bit earlier, the uh, continuation of the industrial out to the Cortland Boundary Agreement, which is shown in the diagonal coloring there. Uh, we also in expanded some in industrial areas over here west of Route 23 a little bit. There are some uh, county subdivisions that are platted, so if anything in the county that's platted subdivision, single family, they're recognized on the plan, but little farmsteads that are part of the farm, that's just, we threw that in as ag. Uh, this shows more of the downtown area and areas a little bit to the east, so uh, still got some uh, review to do here, uh, but again, this is all built up pretty much, so we're, the land use shown in there is just kind of reflecting the land use that's on the property, so no big really changes there. Um, so that's this the first part of the comp plan. We'll come back with probably more look at more detail in certain neighborhoods. Uh, some more work to do on our end to get, you know, taking a look into almost parcel by parcel sometimes to make sure it's a land use matches what's there or what we want to see. So, and then we'll get some policy direction. Some of these are going to be what does the commission think would be good for this area? Um, so that's a, the, it on the goals and objections. I'll let Bill finish up here with okay. the urban design guidelines. And just before I do, uh, you're, you're trying to read on a screen these maps. Uh, we'll have 11 by 17 for you, and ultimately the, the comp plan final document will have of a multi-folded thing you can pull out so you can actually read it and study it. Um, one other thing I want to leave you with, uh, uh, demographically speaking, we have a challenge which has been building into the makeup of our, of our, of who we are, people-wise, uh, that is uh, posing a challenge, and you see it in your day-to-day, -day, but you may wonder, well, how did this happen? And what we've got from, and it was confirmed in the most recent census, the 2020 decennial census and follow-on uh, analysis. We have for about 10 to 15 years had a double hump camel as you look from birth to death. And people are living a little longer, so this is going, birth is still zero. <laughs> but what we have from about, say, 15 to the late 20s in terms of, of uh, age, uh, is a rise in, uh, in pretty steady from the last comp plan to today. It shows that that's still a growing part of our population, year in and year out. And then it falls pretty precipitously down into a deep trough and doesn't come up again until about the low 50s, early 50s, mid 50s, and then goes up and goes up for a long time 
because of our longer staying power, and then drops off in the mid-70s. And what does that mean? So what do you find between 30 and 55? You find family-raising years. You find the, the, uh, the, the sauce that keeps people here rather than seeing a lot of people going to school, matriculating here, starting, you know, working a little, and then deciding, I'm, I know what my career is, and it's somewhere else. And our community to, to really be the vibrant community we want is going to rely on all our best plans and so forth. It's going to rely on starting to retain and build up that, that trough in the middle. And you see it in your work, and uh, it's, a, it's something we have to focus on at, in the government and uh, and other taxing bodies, so we're going to have to do that. Schools are important and all that, of course. Uh, we're we're having to uh, come up with a mix of of housing and a mix of industrial and commercial too that makes sense, and that we ne really need to invite companies to come in and incentivize them if they are creating uh, career jobs, not just jobs, but career jobs can sustain. And, and take another look when you get a chance at page 27 in your, your book here. And look at the affordability numbers. It's real important you see that because you know as, as a business owner uh, that's, that's, that's a critical piece too. All right, so enough of that. Uh, going forward, urban design guidelines are, uh, well, there, there was some reference to uh, permeable pavers here earlier tonight. All that, uh, you know, in, in a thousand ways adds up to how we design the built space around us. And there is a chapter, uh, which is chapter five, that's dedicated to it. It's, it's a first pass. Uh, it's, it's pretty general, but uh, it starts on page 55. I'd like you to look at that. This is where we can let, let it fly a little bit. And uh, we, we have tried uh, to uh, incorporate some of these, these guidelines and action steps. Uh, there's more work to be done. And as you can see here and there, we've left blanks to show that we have to go back, look at our unified development ordinance, see ways that we can help uh, expand uh, the, the the way people creatively build their environment around them. And uh, one of those was referenced tonight, and Dan and I have been talking about this for about a year and a half or so, and that's the number of parking spaces we require. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do also. Uh, you know, we've, we've been, uh, the city, our, our own worst enemy. We've been building streets 36 feet wide from back of curb to back of curb, and now we have problems re keeping them in drivable shape, right? So we have parking on both sides and broad 12-foot lanes. It doesn't mean that I want to see us get into uh, the, the kind of narrow, say, uh, ultra-urban uh, environments where you're worried about uh, scraping the car on the side and there's no place to park and all that stuff. But between that extreme and any other, there's got to be a happy medium somewhere. We, uh, frankly, can't afford to continue to build streets like that or to pave and repave those. So, uh, all these things come into urban design, and uh, your thoughts as we go along are going to be very welcome in this. So thank you for that. I, I think it's getting late. I, 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 we could say more. There's also a chapter which, which, that's missing, and that's ultimately there's a chapter six, which is implementation, and that's maybe the easiest thing. When we've all uh, just exhausted ourselves of what we want to see, then we just say, all right, here's some of the steps. We might do a couple more sub-area plans. I'd like to see us do an over, we have a, a design uh, study that was done in 2017 on the downtown that looks specifically at the historic architecture and it's uh, sort of a lost treasure. And I think we should bring that out and talk about it some more and then see what we'd like to see. Uh, uh, there was a lady in the audience tonight who's uh, a member of, or was a member of the Landmark Commission which hasn't met in four to five years, and I think it quietly went, uh, quietly went silent, it's, it's odd, um, it's late. <laughs> but uh, what, how else could you go silent? Yeah. So, uh, but I th it was a very aggressive uh, approach, 
And I think by default, or kind of a passive aggressive way, the government has sort of backed off of enforcing some of it. So when you have that, that means let's, we need to look at it again. What, are, what can we do to encourage, uh, not necessarily architecturally significant uh, designs like we have in the downtown, but others. We, we want to keep, say, a Craftsman house, but if we get too much detail about how we want to see that porch painted and, and the rest, then when a new family comes in and, want, and loves the house and wants to get in and wants to re restore it in some way, they can't afford to do it the way we want it. So we have to have some middle ground there, and I think that was the problem with what we did. It was a good effort. It was a good idea. It just didn't play out, so we have to go back and think about that, I think. So that's all I have. Dan, do you? No. <coughs> Thank you both. <coughs> uh, obviously, we have a lot, of, a lot more reading and a lot of brainstorming to do, so yeah, do. Uh, I, I look forward to the process. Yeah, me too. Um, that is the end of our show. Um, <laughs> Anyone else have any comments, suggestions? No? Uh, if not, I'll ask for a move to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Motion by O'Flaherty. Seconded by? I second. Seconded by Pena Graham. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. And that's right when the mics go off. <laughs> <laughs>